everybody, hello, and thank you for attending this evening's lecture, which is part of the Spring Common Word Community Read. Dr. Wiley Cash, unfortunately, could not join us tonight. He is stuck in Wilmington, but he brings all his best regards, and he's left me some notes to read to you all. Um, so our selection for this semester is Wilmington's Lie, The Murderous Coup of 1898 and the Rise of White Supremacy. A group of you all just returned from Wilmington yesterday, where you spent the weekend learning more about 1898, its causes, and its effects. Um, you all took a walking tour along the street where the first victims were murdered. You also learned about the turpentine industry and toured an antebellum mansion built upon the backs of enslaved workers on turpentine farms. You were able to draw a distinct line from enslavement to reconstruction to the race massacre of 1898. Tonight, that line will continue with Professor Gibney's presentation. I want to remind you all to join us here at 6 p.m. on the evening of April 8th when Wiley Cash will be in conversation with Pulitzer Prize winner David Zucchino, who is the author of Wilmington's Lie. Tonight, we will hear from Professor Mark Gibney, who is the Carol G. Belk Distinguished Professor at UNC Asheville. Since 1984, Dr. Gibney has directed the Political Terror Scale, which measures levels of physical integrity violations in more than 185 countries. In 2011, Dr. Gibney was recognized by the Human Rights Section of the American Political Science Association as a distinguished human rights scholar. And in 2006, he received the International Human Rights Award from the North Carolina Coalition on Human Rights. Friends, please welcome Dr. Mark Gibney. Ready for a president to unload it. 
And then we'll talk a bit about the Supreme Court opinion in the Colorado versus Anderson case where there was an attempt by Colorado to remove the president for engaging in insurrection. And then uh, Congressman QAnon Shaman. Uh, and you think I'm joking about this. Uh, maybe I am. Maybe I am, but not as much as you would think I am. Okay, so let's begin with then uh, this attempt by, under US law, it goes back up to English law, back to Carta, one of the grievances in the, in the Declaration of Independence is to keep the military out of civilian affairs. So the act here is the Posse Comitatus Act. Uh, I won't read that. I'm gonna show you a few federal statutes and I'll try not to read, assuming most of you can read. Most of you can read. Uh, but the bottom line here is that this, this is the law that attempts to maintain the separation between civilian law enforcement and, uh, and the military. But of course there's an exception. Right, and the exception here comes in the form of this thing called the Insurrection Act of 1807, but it's a series of acts from what, 1792 to 1874, and then um, let me just explain it uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, like an elevator speech here, that you have uh, th essentially three different sections. So the first section, the section 251, is when a state requests the president to invoke the Insurrection Act because of some problems with law enforcement in, the, in that particular state. So the first section, section 251, do you find, is there a noise here or something like that? It's my breath, bad breath. Is this better? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I kept thinking someone was, uh, and by the way, I, I need to maybe turn my phone off. Oh, hold on a second. Uh, <laughs> could, could you give me a second here? Uh, always prepared. Always prepared. If it goes off, you'll answer, right? Okay. So, so Section 251 is that a state asks for permission, and the president acts. The second, the Section 252 is that the president, and again, the language, we'll go through some of the language here, whatever the president considers that unlawful obstructions and so on, this is done without the consent of, this, of, the, of the state. And then the third one here, the section 253, is, um, it says allowing the president to call up the state militia, the National Guard, or federal troops, or the language is any other means. And it's this any other means that both the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers were thinking we're ready to protect the best interests of the United States here. But the legislation here would give the president the authority to go outside the state militia, to go outside the federal military. Uh, and then it's, again, a lot of language here and so on here. So. Uh, Here's our, here's our history, walk through history. See if you can transport yourself back to sixth grade or something like that. But some of these things probably should be familiar. Maybe this is the way history is taught, unfortunately. But you have a series of events, essentially 30 crises here where the president invoked the Insurrection Act. You have Washington with the Whis Whiskey Rebellion, Adams with Fry's Rebellion, Andrew Jackson three times invoked the Insurrection Act including the uh, Matt Turner's Rebellion, Lincoln for the Civil War, perhaps most obviously, Ulysses S. Grant six times, particularly trying to fight for the KKK, Hayes with the Great Railroad Strike, Grove of Cleveland three times, the Pullman Strike, Hoover with the Bonus Army. You go one more slide here. Uh, we have Franklin Roosevelt with the Detroit Race Riots of 1943, Eisenhower with the Little Rock desegregation crisis, Kennedy with James Merritt Meredith. Uh, some of you, I know none of you are old enough to remember James uh, uh, those events, but this I think was 1962, uh, where there's the attempt to integrate to integrate the University of Mississippi, uh, and also George Wallace standing in the school the, that the president had invoked the Insurrection Act at that time. 
Lyndon Johnson with the Selma March, uh, the 1967 Detroit riots, post Martin Luther King assassination where the Insurrection Act was invoked, Ronald Reagan with the, uh, 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 attempt to uh, quell a riot for some 2,500 Cuban detainees, and then finally, and the last time that the Insurrection Act was invoked was in 1992 by George, uh, 92 would have been the father or the son? No, the father. Father H and Father uh, George H.W. Bush for the Rodney King riots. And so since then, it has not been invoked, which is the longest period of time that the Insurrection Act is not, has not been invoked. Uh, when has the Insurrection Act not been invoked? Well, most of the political violence in the United States here, and I, this is the only mention I have in the Wilmington military coup of 1898, but this would have been a prime case, right? You have an insurrection, you have a you have an African American uh, government in the city of Wilmington, and you have uh, these white supremacists who come in with the machine gun and all this kind of stuff, and 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 take over. Uh, and yet, the Insurrection Act, an insurrection for sure. The Insurrection Act invoked by the president, no. The Tulsa Race Massacre, 1921, same kind of thing. Uh, no invocation of the of the uh, uh, Insurrection Act. The same year, Greenwood Race Massacre in Florida, 1921. Uh, no attempt to invoke the Insurrection Act. So it seems to be rather problematic here. Well, we get to then 2020 here, we have Senator Tom Cotton, among others, by the way. So I just singled him out. But Tom Cotton calls for Donald Trump, President of the United States, to invoke the Insurrection Act and subject demonstrators to what he, and I'm quoting here directly, to, uh, to an overwhelming show of force here. So for Tom Cotton here, this is one we have to, this is the president should invoke the, we need to stop this. Uh, doesn't matter that 98% or whatever are peaceful, it's the federal government needs to intercede. We either have to federalize the national militia, or state militia, excuse me, or bring in federal troops. It's not done. And again, how and why it's not done remains somewhat of a mystery here. So then we get to January 6th. Right? We get to January 6th. Uh, and even two months before the election, right? So in September 2020, Roger Stone says that the president should, should invoke the Insurrection Act if he loses. Kind of hedging, hedging is bad. If, if we win, it's, it's okay, okay, but if he loses, he should invoke the, the, the Insurrection Act. On, a, on election night, I don't know if you should remember election night in 2020. You're rolling your eyes here now. I, I mean, this would not play well in my class. We don't have any eye rolling, and there's no sighing. And my, some of my students here, they know that. And so it's uh, bringing back some bad memories. All right, my apologies here. But on election night, you may recall, as the vote is going on, right, as the voting is going on, particularly with the number of absentee ballots, uh, the president said we should call the election that night, right? We should call the election that night. And this is the way we do things. We call the election the day of the election. And, uh, and then says also in his, I guess, uh, congratulatory speech, I don't know what you would call it, or a premature congratulatory speech, that, that he would invoke it if there were riots uh, it, uh, if he won and there were riots, that he wouldn't vote the Insurrection Act. And then following the election, and this shouldn't come as any surprise to you, you have, again, Roger Stone, uh, you have Sidney Powell and the pillow guy, uh, who, who are pushing the president to, uh, to invoke the Insurrection Act. And then finally you have the, the, the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers, who pick up on this expansive language of Section 253, and they're waiting. I mean, they're waiting to, to be part of the, you know, the, the, the law, the domestic law enforcement, right? So the Section 253 allows the president to go outside the state militia, to go outside the federal military, 
He did say during the, one of the debates, right, stand, what is it, stand back and stand by, right? What is it? Stand, stand, whatever. You, you get the gist of this, right? Yeah, well, we can argue later what he said, but uh, I think the, the message was rather clear. Be ready, right, to be ready. And they are ready, right? They're there on January 6th for at the Capitol Grounds here. What's that? Lock and load. There we go. We got this kind of language here. Uh, what else we got here? So what, if, let's, so what if Trump had acted that day? If Trump had acted that day, the first question is, was there an insurrection? Let's take a vote here. I like in my own classes, we vote all the time. All the time. We do vote. How many would say, here's, you got two choices. January 6th. How many would say there is an insurrection? Show of hands here. And how many say there was not? So it's about 50-50. Uh, the, 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 way, the way I read this thing, it's about 50-50 here. Uh, let's be charitable. Let's be charitable. Yeah. Could he have? I don't see anything that would have prevented him from doing so. I mean, of course, the irony here is that this is an insurrection, assuming we're all agreed it's an insurrection. The insur insurrection that he played an instrumental role in, in, in fomenting, right? And so you, you create an insurrection, you then invoke the Insurrection Act to, to, to maintain law and order. Uh, but I don't see anything in the Insurrection Act, and again, we're going to go through the, some of the language here a little bit more closely, but I don't see anything in the Insurrection Act itself that might prevent that. Which is why, again, I call it the, the, this constitutional uh, loaded gun. It does seem, though, that U.S. military leaders were against it, right? The chief of staff, uh, Mark, Mark Milley, had, you know, he had, if you recall that event, and again, my apologies for the, for the flashbacks here, but the George Floyd demonstration where the president walks across uh, Lafayette Square, Holding a Bible. Okay, okay. I knew you were going to add that. I knew you were, were going to add upside down. I know that. I know that. And his ability to read upside down is rather remarkable. I think you would agree with that. But Milley then apologizes, right? Milley, you recall, has the military uh, camouflage on and all this kind of stuff. Very quickly recognizes this was a mistake. Because again, under American law, we're making every effort here to keep the military for foreign affairs. We have domestic law enforcement, state, local, campus, whatever, that does, that does, the, the, does the stuff domestically. So it's not clear that even if he had invoked it, that the military would have gone uh, along with this thing. But I do think he could have. What was surprising to me, is that he, because of the, the amount of violence that day, what was what's surprising to me in hindsight is that he did not invoke the Insurrection Act. He could have achieved what he wanted to, which was the ending of the, of the vote counting. He could have achieved by, I would even say by lawful means, which is to invoke the Insurrection Act. He could have achieved that same end by saying that it is terrible, uh, we need law and order, uh, this is going to be temporary, whatever, and could have had the military escort the senators in the, you know, the, out of the Capitol building here. So the big surprise, I think, for me is that he did not. And then they ask this question at the end, is there anything the Congress or the courts could have done in response, and the answer is no. And again, I'm going to walk through the language here, but it seems to me one of the fatal, the, in my view, one of the fatal aspects of the Insurrection Act is that there's no checks and balances. Right? There's absolutely no checks and balances, and the language here is extraordinarily vague here. So let's move on to that here. So let me talk, just talk about the, the vague language here. You can, I know these, the, these are old statutes here, but the language here is painful. As a lawyer, the, the language here, uh, what, whatever, what is an unlawful obstruction or combinations or assemblages? I, I don't know. I don't know. 
uh, where, it, in other words, if it's impractical to enforce the laws. Hmm, I'm not, I'm not sure. Opposition to the execution of the laws. I'm going to put down maybe a hypothetical here of deploying the 82nd Airborne against two individuals plotting to intimidate a witness in a federal trial would seem to constitute opposition to the execution of the law. So the language here is extraordinarily vague. Right, extraordinarily vague. Uh, the checks and balances. Well, the, the, the irony here is that the militia clause, and again, I know most of you go around like I do carrying a pocket sized constitution here, but if you don't seem to have yours on you, let me just mention that the militia clause, which is Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15, but you already knew that. It empowers Congress to call forth the militia to suppress insurrection. So the irony here is that this, this ability to suppress insurrections is put in Article 1, which is dealing with the powers of Congress. But what happens, like perhaps other powers given to Congress, it's immediately transferred to the executive. I mean, think of the declaring war. That is a power given to the legislature, and yet it's one that presidents have repeatedly simply ignored. But the Insurrection Act, uh, or not the Insurrection Act, but the military, the, the militia clause here gives this power not to the president, but to the legislature. And what the legislature does immediately is it transfers that power to the president and the president alone. So in the, 17, the, the original version of 1792, it did, it did require judicial approval. In other words, before the president could invoke the Insurrection Act, the, the president had to get a, some kind of judicial approval. But Congress removed that restriction in 1795. Uh, and then again, the this forces may be deployed if the president considers that the relevant conditions are satisfied. And then there's not, there hasn't been much uh, litigation of this, but this one case, Martin versus Mott, Mott here, pretty much speaks authoritatively here, is that the judiciary is not going to get involved. Right? If the president invokes the Insurrection Act, it's the president's call. It's not the call of Congress. It's not the call, the, uh, the call of the courts. It's the president's call which again is one of the things I find quite scary. And I don't mean to give, be giving you people nightmares here, but that's one of the things that I think, uh, particularly with the kind of verbiage that's heating up during this presidential campaign and what some of the consequences might be later on here. So zero accountability. There's no, there's no role for Congress to play. There's no oversight. There's no time limit. It doesn't say that we'll put, the, I'll invoke the Insurrection Act and it's going to be in place for, you know, many of the things that we had seen were these singular events, right? The Detroit race riots or something like that, right? The, the Pullman. But there's no reason why it has to be limited uh, by time because there's nothing in the Act that says that. Uh, there's no requirement of exhausting non-military means. And, uh, and then finally, uh, the, the act allows the president to use armed forces as he considers necessary. Kind of a loose standard, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so maybe we can reform it. Maybe we need to reform it, and maybe we better hurry up and reform it if the, if the polls seem to be accurate here. Maybe we need to move quickly on this one. The first question is, and this is one I've wrestled with here, do we even need an Insurrection Act? I mean, you know, when the Insurrection Act was first created or established, uh, this was when you didn't have local law enforcement, for the most part. Right? You didn't have local law enforcement, you didn't have National Guards and stuff like that. So one of the questions here is, do you really need a federal, do you really need, do you really need this? You may have needed it, or you may not have needed it, but is it still needed? And as I said, I go back and forth on that as well. How about if we have, if we amend the Insurrection Act 
to require some kind of consultation with Congress before invoking it. I like that. I don't know if you're on board with that, but I'd like to see some system of checks and balances here. Uh, maybe before deploying forces, the president should be required to disseminate public proclamation and explain why. Explain why he's uh, uh, invoking the Insurrection Act. Uh, have military leaders submitting reports as opposed to this sort of open-ended thing and maybe make this something like the War Powers Act that the president has to report to Congress within 48 hours of deployment and then have some kind of time limits subject to congressional extension. So maybe that's not such a bad way. Uh, certainly to my mind, and I think there's always a sympathetic audience if I give a talk in Asheville, and by the way, not Hendersonville. Oh, no, no, you, you don't want to go down there. But, but, but in Asheville, there's always a sympathetic audience here. And I think many of you would say, you'd give me a big write on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you would say vote. <laughs> no, not, none of this one, none of this one. Okay, so in hindsight here, we're going to get to the, the juiciest stuff here in a second. So in hindsight, maybe we haven't so, done such a bad job, right? Maybe these 30 crises here, maybe given American history, it's, it, it hasn't been bad that, that for the most part that the default position, which is, you recall, the uh, uh, Posse Comitatus Act, but for the most part, we have kept the military out of civilian affairs. Maybe we give them, let's see if I'm grading this as a professor, C plus, B minus, what do you, what do you think here? C? Maybe we vote on this one. I'm going to say, I'll give them an A. I'll give them an A? No. B, B, C, 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 I. That's the way I grade. I like that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, should we be saying when the Insurrection Act, um, oh, there, there's some abuses. Right? I was particularly bothered by the breaking of the strikes. Right? I think the breaking of the strikes here, the bonus army, I, I mean, I think at this point now he's just working as the, the enforcement arm of, of corporations here. Uh, the fact that we haven't invoked the Insurrection Act since 1992, should we be should we be pleased with that? I, I'm not sure what the what I would think of that. Should we be sanguine that Donald Trump never did invoke the Insurrection Act? Maybe, but maybe here's a different question. Should we be frightened? Should we be frightened if Donald Trump assumes the office, assumes dictatorship for one day? Isn't that the promise? The first day, just the first day. But the language here of vermin, right, the language of vermin, bloodbath was the, the, the I, that's the one reason I think that when I say well, this isn't just a history lesson about the Insurrection Act, I think it's a very real peril, right? I do, I think it's a very real peril that you have the means legally to kind of do the kind of things to your political enemies. Uh, and I guess under that theory, you also wouldn't face any kind of criminal responsibility because when you're president, you can order that, what is it, Delta Force 6 or something to assassinate your political enemies. I'm making reference to the immunity uh, argument as well. So here, let's get to the Supreme Court uh, thing because I think you'll have some, some views on this. So we have, have a situation where Colorado, I think it's Colorado, Maine, and Illinois removed Donald Trump from the ballot on the basis that under the 14th Amendment, Section 3, bars individuals who, quote, have, or, quote, have, quote, engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the United States or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. So that's the language here. Now, if someone is barred, then by a vote of two-thirds of each house, that, that, that person could be, um, could be reinstated. So in other words, you're barred, from, you're barred from running, but the two-thirds of the house could, remo could remove that disability, and you'd still be allowed to run here. Uh, but the court says no. What the court says here, and this is a 9 nothing opinion, 
uh, which says no, that we don't want each state to be making its own laws. Right? We don't want that the president, that someone like Donald Trump is removed from Colorado, but he's able to run another thing. So that was the, the gist of the Supreme Court's opinion, but essentially goes even further than this and said that states have no role whatsoever. Right? Not for federal offices. Now states could remove people for state offices, but the court was unequivocal that not no state could remove someone for a federal office. Okay, and that was the holding. Um, and rather that this is up to Congress. But here's the thing. If what, it, what the, the court's ruling is that essentially the Congress has to take action to disqualify. If they take no action, then there's no disqualification. So states may want to disqualify, but they're barred from doing so. So there has to be some kind of action by the, the Congress to, remove, to, to disqualify somebody from running here. So I thought maybe we'd take a look at the Civil War. Era and see if we could have any kind of lessons from this here. So we have a situation, we have the war ending in 1865, and you had a, uh, a white supremacist. I mean, after the assassination of Lincoln, you have a white supremacist, Andrew Johnson, who is in the, who's, a, who's president, and he's issuing a whole set of pardons to these ex-Confederates. And so the Congress comes in, and they passed what's called the Enforcement Act of 1870, uh, also known as the Ku Klux Klan Act, because a number of people who, in the Klan were, who were running for, for office here. So we have two sections of this Enforcement Act of 1870 that allow uh, federal prosecutors to bring legal actions against the state executive officials and judges. And Tennessee was probably one of the best examples where these federal prosecutors remove, I think, half of the state Supreme Court because they were ex-Confederates, and, and a few other, a few other, uh, a few other officers in that state as well. And then you also had that each house took some kind of action on its own, and, and I think one of the. Uh, uh, what was his name? I think Andrew Stevens. Who was the vice president? This is a quick pop quiz here. Who was the vice president of the Confederacy? Oh, come on, now, you guys. I mean, have you not been paying attention? Uh, what is it? You think we well, you're the guy giving the talk? You, 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 you don't know this. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, hold on, hold on, uh. Alexander Stevens, come on, Alexander Stevens, it was Alexander Stevens, yeah, I had that one right, Alexander Stevens was, uh, was, the, was the vice president of the, of the Confederacy, war's over, he thinks, well, I'm just going to go back to being a congressman, you know, shows up in Washington, D.C., and, uh, you know, I'm ready to resume my activities, what happens there is that the clerk of court doesn't call his name and some of the other Confederates, right? So you're going through the alphabet here, we get to Stevens, no mention of Alexander Stevens' name here. The other case here, I don't know, you know, you remember, those of you longtime Asheville residents know a lot about the Vance name, do you not? Uh, you know the monument that we used to have downtown. Uh, but uh, Zebulon Vance was a vote voted to the U.S. Senate, former Confederate, and um, the Senate just on its own refuses to seat him, right? Refuses to seat him, and finally he gives up and I guess comes back to Asheville. But uh, th that was, so it was, it was right, I think the, the surprise to me as I've looked into this is it was kind of hit or miss. Right, it was kind of hit or miss. You had these private bills that sometimes passed. You had maybe the, the, these federal prosecutors who were removing people. You had each house at times would take some kind of action against those who, who had uh, engaged with the Confederacy. And then finally in 1872, you have the Amnesty Act, right? So in 1872, which is only seven years after the end of the Civil War, 
The decision is we need to mend, uh, we need to mend, we need to be one nation, and so there this, this, um, the Amnesty Act of 1872 pretty much removes the disability for all, all the former Confederates. So this is the, you know, oftentimes we think of 1877 and the compromise of the presidential election where Reconstruction ends, but you may bring that back a couple years to 1872, because at that point now, there's a green light that if you're part of the Confederacy, you can still now assume place in the national government here. The only two, by the way, who didn't get exonerated by the Amnesty Act of 1872 is Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis. Their disabilities was removed in the mid-1970s. And I don't know if I remember that so much, but it was kind of, I, you know, I, I, what, what was behind that? Because I think we look at this now uh, as we're taking down the Robert E. Lee statutes, right, in the, in the uh, I don't know if there's any Jefferson Davis statutes around, but as these things are coming down to think, well, 1975 wasn't that long ago, and yet, you know, we at that point decided to remove, now of course, they were both very old men. Yeah. At that time, you know, you do need to understand that both of them probably. To talk about age being a disability in this election, I think both of them would have suffered from that as well here. Oh, so, are there any other routes here for for disability here? Again, I'm not going to read. I'm not going to read the statutes here, but there are two other ways that someone could be prevented from holding office here. The first is to be convicted of rebellion or insurrection. And if you've done that, 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 but if you read the, la the very last phrase there, and the second one is if someone is convicted of treason. The problem is, is that none of the January 6th uh, insurrectionists, uh, uh, your point of view is that, or patriots, if you're of a different uh, political ilk, uh, hostages uh, would be another. That, that none have been tried for either rebellion or insurrection or treason. And then, so we end, let me, this is my last slide here, which is what I say is Congressman uh, QAnon uh, Shaman, which is that he's running, he is running for office in the state of Arizona. And let me just say, if there is a state that would elect someone like QAnon Shaman, I think it would be Arizona, don't you think? I mean, again, it's not the whole state, it's a section of the state. He's running for office, and I guess I'm ending on sort of a humorous note, but also to say, I don't see what would prevent him from assuming office, right? The state of Arizona can't do anything. That's the Colorado versus Anderson only. So there's nothing that the state itself can do, even though I'm not convinced the state itself would do something, but assuming they could, I don't think they're good. So then it's left up to Congress. And again, the Supreme Court's ruling is that the Congress has to act. Right? They have to act. What's called in law that, that, that this section, section three here, is not self is not is not self-enforcing. You need some kind of action by the Congress here to remove the person. And I don't know if I see it, and I'm not even so sure what would be appropriate. Would it be that each house could pass, and you're doing it individual by individual? Is that how you're doing it? I mean, I do think that, whereas the court said that the Colorado decision would lead to kind of chaos, because you'd have different states doing different standards, and Trump's name on some state ballots and other others, but I don't think you're avoiding the chaos here by by this, because it's not clear to me how you keep how you keep these insurrectionists from running for political office and then assuming their place in the in the Congress here. So, with that, let me end. And and I, I know the particularly Asheville audiences always have a lot of good questions, a lot of good questions here. So let me just take some questions here. Can you may I do that? Yeah. And I'll repeat it as well. Just try to speak loudly if you could. Oh, do we have some microphones? Yeah. Okay. I will think you give me another one. You work one and I'll take one? Okay. How do you turn it on?
Oh, yeah, we got a whole crew here. I mean, uh, yeah. Oh, you go ahead, please. I had a question about going back to the Amnesty Act of yeah. 1872. Um, what was at play, economic forces or anything, to uh, suddenly have the forgiveness take place? It wasn't just a political change of heart, I wouldn't imagine. No, but I think you're seeing it today. You're seeing that people's memories fade. I mean, there was just a, uh, a, a graphic in the New York Times uh, about whether Donald Trump had committed serious, serious criminal offenses. And one of the things that was surprising to me, and maybe it shouldn't have been surprising, is that the number of people saying that he had committed serious criminal offenses had declined uh, significantly, particularly among independents. Now, Democrats, are, yes, 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 serious criminal offenses. Repu Republicans, no, no, no. But it was the independents where the number of saying that, and I think you had that in 1872. You would say that you know there's an attempt to bring the southern states back into the union, and the very first attempts there were not successful because because they they wanted to go back to business as usual immediately in 1865, and so you passed I think the first Military Reconstruction Act that said you had to agree you had to you had to um, ratify the 14th Amendment. Okay, so then the ratification comes in 1868, and at that point now in 1872, the war is viewed as ancient history, let bygones be bygones, and the problem is, is the bygones were not bygones. As you know, that pretty much life went almost in, uninterrupted from what it had been during the war, but I think that was it. I, I think it was more sort of this lack of willpower. And again, it wasn't 1877 really where the, the demise of Reconstruction, I would even put it earlier, and maybe even earlier than 1872. I mean, Johnson passing out these pardons. You know, we need to get back to the, the business of that. Other questions here? Yeah, do you have a microphone? And raise your hand, and maybe we get you a microphone if, if you have, uh, yeah. On January 6th, wasn't Admittedly, belatedly, the uh, D.C. National Guard mobilized, and if so, how did that happen without it, the insurrection? It, it, was, it, was, it wasn't federalized. So, so the only distinction here is that sometimes, I mean, think of, let's take another one. I mean, I was a bit surprised that the George Wallace standing in the schoolhouse, so that was listed as one of the times that the Insurrection Act was. But what happened in that instance is you had the president at that time, John Kennedy, federalize the Alabama National Guard. And so in a way, you still have a National Guard, but now it's under federal control. But if you think of something like some of the race riots in 1967 and 1968, you actually had federal troops, right? A member of federal troops in Newark, federal troops in Detroit. So in some instances, it's a federalization of the federalization of the National Guard. And that's sort of, uh, but what happened on January 6th was that there was no attempt to uh, invoke the Insurrection Act and federalize, let's say, the Maryland National Guard or the Virginia Guard. But and the, there's a DC Guard, which is, isn't that by definition federal? I, but it's, I, I agree with you that, that, that you're getting, we're getting into, yeah, it, it, it is part of the federal government, isn't it? Uh, but I, I guess when I think of the insurrection, I, I tend to think more just military as well. But you're right, though. You, technically, you're probably correct. Yeah. Other questions here? Please, yeah. Mike? Again, if you have questions here, raise your hand and we'll uh, get you a microphone. No. Just uh, kind of interesting. In, there was a report today that the Supreme Court had denied uh, hearing a case with a Sheriff, and I think it was Missouri, but I'm not sure of the state, that uh, had been removed by the state court for insurrection for being part of the January 6th. Yeah. Uh, so that would be totally within the state. Yes, I agree. But on the other hand, when you mentioned that the, uh, I 
of the Congress, of course, moved, went into Tennessee and removed state Supreme Court. Right. That seems contradictory, if not yes. inconsistent. Yes. You're right. And you had federal prosecutors removing state officials for insurrection, but what the Colorado holding was that states can, cannot remove the ability to run for federal office. But I do think you're right. You would think that the two would be uh, equal, but they're not. But they're not. But again, the court went out of its way to say that if the if the state wanted to remove state officials from running, that they could do so. On, they could do so under this Fourteenth Amendment, Paragraph Three. But what you're not to do, the court said, is to attempt to restrict people from running for federal office. So. And again, that was what brought forth, what brought forth sort of the dissent by the four females on the court. Three in particular was that they made it seem as if the court set forth that there has to be some act by Congress. Because I'm thinking, they're thinking that maybe that there's other ways of doing it. All right, maybe we don't want each state to do so, but perhaps we can come up with some other means here. Because I do think the ability of the of states, excuse me, the, the ability of Congress to get its act together to do something like the 1870 Enforcement Act, I don't think there's any kind of willpower with that. And that's why when I say at the end with the QAnon shaman, I don't see any way of keeping this guy, assuming he wins. Uh, but I can tell from, you know, uh, that would be a great campaign poster, wouldn't it? I mean, him, him standing in the halls of Congress. Uh, uh, I don't see anything now after the Colorado ruling that would prevent the state from being able to do so, nor do I think there's the political willpower by the Congress to make him not be able to get in. Yeah. Question here. Yeah. Question. Uh, what were all these January 6th? insurrectionists or whatever in the charges, including this guy, what were they charged with? I mean, and secondly, yeah. I don't know, maybe your last slide under the, the statute is Robert Smith's uh, prosecution of Trump in D.C. under one of these no, statutes. No, it's not. So what they're being charged with is obstruction of the vote count. All right, so what the, what the people who have, and, that, and the Supreme Court is hearing an oral argument here whether that was an appropriate criminal statute to apply. So the conviction, I mean, there's been a few convictions for sedition. There's been no convictions for insurrection or treason. Uh, so, so, but the charge here has been obstruction of and I'm, I'm, I'm being a little loose with this, but obstruction was sort of the vote counting in, in, uh, in terms of the electoral votes. Now the court, the Supreme Court, which is going to be hearing oral argument, might come down and say, well, that's not sufficient. I don't know if I was a prosecutor, if I would have gone for something like rebellion or insurrection, or, I mean, if, hey, if this is my jury, uh, hell, I, 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 go, I, I mean, if, I, if this is my jury, I would be going for insurrection, rebellion, sedition, uh, treason. Uh, is there anything else here that I've missed here? You know, I, I would be, but but particularly, again, I, how this whole January 6th thing has evolved, to my mind, has been frustrating. I mean, um, I have a son who's a criminal defense attorney who always is, is, is reminding me that I don't know much about law. Okay. Uh, but I say to him, what I don't understand, and I think I do speak for most Americans on this, is how and why it has taken this bloody long to get here. And I maintain that if I'm an enterprising district attorney in the District of Columbia, I have political ambitions, do I not? Yes, that's why I'm a district attorney. On January 7th, I'm filing indictments. That's what I'm doing, and my name is plastered worldwide, is it not? Yes, it is. Prosecutor Gibney, and he's bringing Trump. I don't get how and why it's now 2024, 
and we're still and we're still here. But for the most part, no no attempt to convict for insurrection, rebellion, uh, treason, or anything like that. And we'll see if the Supreme Court uh, gives the green light to the prosecutor in terms of this obstruction of this governmental function of voting of of county votes here. I don't get it myself. Other questions here? Yeah, please in the back. Thanks a lot. Without having any checks and balances, yeah. uh, it occurs that there's no need for any kind of justification to invoke that act. No. And second of all, uh, it could be as long as he wants it to be. No. I, there's no time limit in the, in, the, in the statute. And how does that differ from martial law? Yes. yes. Is there a question there? <laughs> yeah, that was a question. It's, 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 I think I've given my answer. Which is, I don't see a difference. I don't see a difference. I really don't. Yeah. The other question, um, on January 6th, and he had Sidney Powell and somebody else trying to convince him to, to invoke the uh, insurrection. He it uh, really proved that he really enjoyed having their guidance. Why didn't he go ahead and accept their idea? Yeah, I, I don't know, actually. I, 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 Is there any speculation as to why? I haven't, no, I haven't seen it. I mean, I haven't seen it because you are as close as advisors. The the uh, the Molary and Curly of, uh, of advisors that would be Mike Lindell and uh, and, uh, and 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 Roger Stone and Sidney Powell and Rudy Giuliani playing Shep. Uh, you know, I don't get it. I mean, honestly, but I do wonder if, and again, and, and again I wouldn't say this in Hendersonville, but, but in the second uh, Trump administration, my fear is that the Insurrection Act would be invoked. I think that's the fear that I have. Now, it could be that if Biden wins the election and there are riots, then maybe it's Biden who invokes the Insurrection Act. Right, to try to bring some kind of, because I do think that there are certain people who are itching for a some kind of civil war. I mean, I don't think really I'm being incendiary when I say that, but but I do think that if Trump does win, then I one of the concerns I have is that unlike the first term where he did not invoke the Insurrection Act, that he would this time and he would. Uh, they probably, you know, try to arrest some left-wing professor in a kind of little funky town of Asheville, North Carolina. And uh, I'm already packing my bags. That's, uh, the bags are already packed. Other questions here? What we got here? Uh, please. Right here? Yeah. I don't have a mic. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I had a little comment. Early, earlier on, uh, you had a... Uh, I, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I could lower my voice. <laughs> uh, early on, you had a slide that mentioned General Milley and uh, yeah. not being on board. Now, were you saying he was not on board in the invocation of the Insurrection Act? Well, you know, we're speculating. But one of the questions before was why Trump didn't invoke the Insurrection Act. What I'm saying is that it could have been that he was getting an enormous amount of pushback from the from the the, uh, chief, the uh, Milley and other military leaders who were saying to him, "We are not going to do that." So what I'm saying is that he could invoke the Insurrection Act, but you're going to need the military to take some kind of action. And if the military is laying down their arms and saying we're not going to do so, so that may be one of the explanations here. Okay, so so this is my line of thinking there just for a second, maybe you can clarify it. Um, during the alleged insurrection that we all watched on TV, they were trying to stop something that was a legal constitutional process. So I remember really making a statement back there about the oath that the military takes. And in my mind, an invocation of the Insurrection Act would have been the correct thing to do to stop them from interrupting the proceedings. So when you say he was not on board with it, I, I, I'm just having trouble following OK, what, what I mean by that is when I said that Trump could have invoked the Insurrection Act, it would not have been to allow the voting to proceed. 
it would have been to close down the Capitol. It would have been to evacuate the Capitol for how long, we don't know. That's what I'm saying. It wouldn't have been just to maintain the order. I mean, maybe it would have been, but I, I don't. I, can I speak on all of your behalf? I don't think that's why it would have been invoked. I really don't think so. Yeah, that, that, that yeah. was actually what I was yeah. thinking in yeah. terms of the challenge. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. We have more questions here in the back, please. I just want to say, you can hear me without the mic. Yeah. I'm sitting here, and why are the people afraid to say how corrupt our country is? It's just corrupt. Nothing is going according to law. Nothing is going by law. Everybody's mixing it up to, for whatever their reasons are, and I think it's money. Okay, so the question here is more and more common about, I, I, do, I, I do have a sense of frustration, and as I said, I've, I've been frustrated myself. I certainly have been frustrated, and again, you could say, well, it's playing out in the courts, right? It's, it's happening, but I do think, and, and again, if I'm representing Donald Trump, I do exactly what his defense counsel is doing. I do. The longer you could string this thing out, I mean, think what happens if he is reelected, if he's put back, then all these federal charges will be dropped, right? And I, I, I do, I'm maintaining that I think the next Attorney General will be Tucker Carlson. Uh, I'm joking about that. I think I'm joking about that. Please tell me I'm joking about that. But I do think the federal charges, but it still has the state charges. It still has the state charges because uh, he has no control over them. But I do think the courts would allow him a base until the end of his term. I remember the Paula Jones case. Paula Jones case was the woman who brings a case against Bill Clinton. And uh, uh, what happens is the court says, well, we're going to make an exception here. It's a civil case, and he's not going to be too distracted, and it's really quite an exception. I think a criminal case in Georgia or perhaps other states would be treated much differently by the by the by the uh, by the Supreme Court. So you would have the federal charges drop. You would still face the state charges, but it would be that while in office, he would he wouldn't have to be facing uh, the state charges here. And again, my fear is what kind of wrath we might see. And again, using the tool here, which has pretty much no standards, is when the president determines that there's been an obstruction of law and all this kind of stuff. That's the fear that I have. That's sort of the, the things that uh, uh, cause me nightmares. Let me just say that. Other questions here? Yeah, please. With the increase of uh, right-wing ideologies, how would you go about for us to legally combat it? Um, I'm not sure you combat the ideologies. I do think you combat the ability, and that's why I spent that one slide with the reformation of the Insurrection Act. I'm still not convinced you need it at all. I'm still not convinced of that, but if you do, you can do much better than this. Right? I mean, again, think of it. It was a power originally given to Congress that Congress almost immediately turned carte blanche over to the president that with standards that are pretty much standard less, I think there are ways that if you keep the Insurrection Act, you have some involvement by the Congress, you have some involvement by, uh, by maybe the judiciary, but you have none of this. And again, it's all legal because this power has been given up by Congress to that. So I don't know if I would say I want to change ideology, but I know we can do a much better job in terms of putting some kind of check on the, on the president exercising this enormous power, this enormous power under this insurrection act. And just because it hasn't been invoked, and just because it, when it has been invoked, it has been for a particular crisis, there's no reason why, and I do, and I'm, listen, if you thought I'm making this up, all I have to keep saying to you is January 6, 2021. It's not difficult to imagine a scenario where we have something like martial law and for some period of time here. And I think that's sort of the, and again, I think that the Insurrection Act is giving the president a blank check to do that if the president so wishes. And that's the, the concern I have here. 
Do we have any other questions here? Yes, please. Nice and loud. Yeah, is there anybody actually working on reforming the insurrection? Act? Not that I've heard of. Not that I've heard of. No. Not that I've heard of. Yeah. No, and the question here is whether there's been any legislation. Uh, I mean, I'd be kind of curious. I mean, would it be that you'd have the Republicans opposed and the Democrats in favor? I mean, you could have, I, I, guess, you, I guess you might. I mean, I guess you might. Um, but, um, I, I, you know, I, I keep hoping, I mean, there was mentioned before about corruption and stuff like that. Maybe I just, in my naive way, keep thinking that maybe the people in the House and the Senate might rise to the status. You're shaking your head. Like you, don't, you don't want to hear that. Rise, would rise to the level in which, the, in which they're elected, no? I guess I'm naive here. Other questions here, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah, in the back. Yeah, the original context for tonight's talk was a relationship to the 1898 event, yeah. Wilmington situation. Yeah. And we've been talking a lot about the Insurrection, yeah. insurrection Act. Yeah. Could you make a contact between the two, please? Yeah, yeah I would say you, you did point out that one of the 30 events that the, the Fed chose not to apply the Insurrection Act was Wilmington. No, no. I, what I did was the 30 crises where it had been. But one of the, I, I mentioned three of them where the Insurrection Act had not been invoked. What I'm saying is that this invocation of the Insurrection Act has been problematic at best. To my mind, a shining example of when you have an insurrection would have been Wilmington, 1898. This is Exhibit A, Exhibit A of an insurrection, and yet no invocation of the Insurrection Act. Okay, so I could have talked for about five minutes about how it could have been, but you're going to hear David Zucchino, who's going to give you a much more in-depth analysis of the events of 1898. What I'm saying is, particularly when there are atrocities committed against African Americans, Wilmington, 1898, uh, what was it, Tulsa, 1921, uh, you, you don't have it. I mean, you have insurrections at that time, and yet it's never invoked. It's never invoked. And so uh, other times, uh, the Pullman strike, the Bonus Army, uh, the, the, you know, Reagan with the detainees, the Cuban asylum seekers, it's invoked for some things, not for others. Uh, but that's sort of the connection here, because I think in Wilmington, you had a bona fide insurrection, much like you had on January 6th. In one instance, it should have been invoked in terms of Wilmington. And in terms of January 6th, I'm a bit nervous that, that the invocation of the Insurrection Act might have led to even worse things, if you know what I mean. It could have led to martial law. It could have led to someone who refuses to leave the White House and has dissolved Congress, and perhaps even the courts. So that's sort of the connection I'm trying to make on that one here. Other question here. This sounds a, a, uh, sounds a whole lot like a coup. Do we have, is there any language in our Constitution around a coup? Is insurrection and coup interchangeable? No, they would be, inter they'd be uh, they would be. On the other hand, I think that, that many of the things we're looking at were not coups. Like the Whiskey Rebellion, all of those kind of things. We're not coups. The two coups I think we could speak about would be Wilmington. To my mind, would be Wilmington and would be January 6th. Right? In both cases, no invocation of the, of the Insurrection Act. For two insurrections, two coups, if you prefer to use that term. Yeah. Tangential question. Put the, put the mic closer. Sorry. Tangential question. I just finished uh, Tim Alberta's, Alberta's book on the uh, American evangelicals in the age of extremism and the, the rise of, of sort of politicized yeah. politicize the pulpit. Uh, do you know much about that? And do you have an in, do you have a comment about how that impacts the, the next election and, and and so forth? Well, yeah. I mean, if I'm looking at if I'm Donald Trump running his campaign, my base there is the evangelical. Is it not? I mean, that's. Uh, 
and I'm going to do everything in my power to make them happy. And it doesn't seem like he even tries that hard, and he still makes them happy. So, uh, you know, I can't, I can't explain, I can't explain it. But that's his base. That is his base here. Yeah, go ahead. I was just wondering if there's uh, other legal scholars or your son who take a different view of the Insurrection Act and what. Yeah, you know? I don't know. I mean, what kind of different view would you have? I mean, to my mind, it goes so directly contrary. You know, I make fun of some of my students, some of whom are here because they believe in, they are checks and balances. They saw some kind of movie in fourth grade. What was the name of that movie? How a bill becomes law, but, but, but uh, every other word out of their mouth is checks and balances, checks and balances. So we all genuflect at the altar of checks and balances, and they make fun of it, at least make fun of my students in class. But the American governmental system is based on checks and balances. And then you got the Insurrection Act. No check, no balance whatsoever. Unbridled power, right? Unbridled power to decide when an insurrection occurs and how it must be met. And again, I think we've been lucky that we haven't had martial law, okay? I think we've been lucky. How much, how, how long will this luck, how long will this luck continue? I'm not feeling it myself. Please, yeah. It occurs to me that um, the overwhelming majority of people in this U.S. have no concept of the Insurrection Act. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So the only way they're going to learn this is if they take your class or sit in here. <laughs> uh, is that the best we can do? Well, I'm, I'm thinking the explanations that you've done have been uh, on point. Well, let me say this. I do find it surprising that there's not discussion about this. I mean, I really do. I mean, I, I find it quite surprising that there hasn't been, I mean, particularly having lived through one insurrection where the Insurrection Act was not invoked. But I would have thought that this would have led to more, uh, more of a national, uh, it, more discussion about this, more concern about the lack of, of guardrails here, right? I, I, but be, maybe because Trump didn't invoke the Insurrection Act, we somehow think, well, that's that. But again, I think if he had, I would say, A, he could have. Perhaps he even should have. I don't know if I'd go that far. But the third one is, if he had, I don't think it's a happy ending. I don't think it's a happy ending. So I am surprised that there hasn't been a, a sort of a national con a conversation about something like and how would we make that a national conversation? Uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, if you were one of my students, I'd say, well, you need to get politically active. You need to, this, that, and the next thing. You need to, the future is, 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 is yours. Or you could have uh, someone in the Senate use that as a, as a uh, kind of a bully pulpit type of discussion. I, it is surprising to me that, that again, I would say even even uh, news coverage and stuff like that. It's always been kind of personality driven. Trump did this, Biden did this, Trump did this. But, I, but I, to my mind, what, what's, what is scarier about this is not how many, you know, how many counts, how many indictments Donald Trump has. It's more, what are we doing to prevent something like this from happening? And I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it. I think that's, the, that's one of the most unfortunate things. I have one more thing, okay. and then I'll give the mic up to, to someone else. Uh, it occurs to me that uh, in order to work on this uh, Insurrection Act, it's a simple matter of modifying and making more concise the ambiguous language that's there. I, I, that would be helpful, would it not? And the second thing is, uh, with Mike Johnson being a puppet for uh, Mr. Trump, uh, the likelihood of Congress doing something it's a pretty steep climb. And that's the part I said. But that's why I ended with the QAnon shaman. That because if you need something to prevent him from taking office, it can't be the state, right? The Supreme Court has spoken. What would it be? I, I don't know. I think he, if elected, uh, would assume his, his lawful, rightful place in the... What's that? And there's no, there's no longer a dress code. Other
comments, questions here? Yeah, please. The Supreme Court. Yeah, please. No, go ahead. Um, the Supreme Court going forward with uh, the threat of uh, an insurrection and a takeover into martial law. Yeah. Um, what do you see, do they, is there any kind of a role, preventative role, that they uh, can play? I mean, the, the, the confidence level in the public of the Supreme Court is at an all-time low. And it certainly seems in the current uh, makeup where you have life, lifetime appointments. Yeah. yeah. But again, it, it, you don't need to act against the Supreme Court because they're very sympathetic to you, right? And so if I'm Donald Trump, I come into office, I invoke the uh, Insurrection Act to go against my enemies, the communists, the vermin, all this kind of stuff. I don't need to dissolve the court because the court is probably going to be ruling in my favor. I may have to dissolve uh, you know, the, the, the House of Representatives and the Senate kind of stuff, but uh, I don't think he needs to go against the courts. And again, I, I, I think if there's fault here, the fault really lies more in Congress. Congress willingly gave up this power in almost initially. They gave up the power. They have put it squarely in the hands of the president, and they've done nothing to try to to pre prevent the. And again, we could say, well, it's never going to happen. Come on, I mean, it's never going to happen. And just when you think something never is going to happen, it happens. And I think we've already seen an example of that. You got any question in the back here, please? It seems to me that what you're talking about is Trump, who's not the brightest bulb in the pack here. And when he had his advisors on January 20th, they were not very good advisors either. But since that time, there have been people that have been getting, jumping on his bandwagon that do have brains. And I'm guessing they didn't do anything about the Insurrection Act because they didn't even think about it. And the conservative part of the nation hadn't thought about such a thing until they saw something in action. Yeah, but I must say, though, a lot of his advisors were pushing for him to invoke it. They were. I mean, I think, I think as I said, the pillow guy, uh, Sidney Powell and Roger Stone, and, and there were others. I mean, those are three that I knew were pushing for him to invoke the Insurrection Act. And again, I think one of the great mysteries is why he didn't. And it, again, maybe the explanation is that there, there was pushback from there was pushback from the military, much like there was pushback from the Justice Department, right? So there was going to be, and the Justice, you know, there will be uh, mass, you know, will. Resignations, massive resignations by the Department of Justice that would make the Saturday Night Massacre. You people are too young to remember, but Richard Nixon fired on a, that's, that's a joke. I know you're old enough to do that. But, but in a sense, that would have made this look like just a, just a nothing. So maybe it was that. But I do think that there were a number of his advisors that were pushing him. I do. Yeah, Larry, go ahead. Who's got a microphone? How, how would the timing work? That is, wouldn't it be the last moment that an ex exiting president could invoke the, top, the uh, yeah. Insurrection Act before the incoming president yeah. could either undo it or stop it? Yeah. Well, maybe the outgoing president will invoke the Insurrection Act. Let me just, speaking hypothetical, Nick, may invoke it when he's about to leave office to prevent himself from having to leave office. And I think that is probably one of the things that Trump's advisors were saying for him to do. They certainly were, I mean, Roger Stone to be pushing for the invocation of the Insurrection Act in September. I mean, I'm thinking when the election was November, wasn't it? So September, two, so two months before the election to be pushing for him in case he loses. But I would, the fear I would have is that a president who wants to stay in office would let's say, loses the election, invokes the Insurrection Act, and then what we have is a very bad situation. But it sounds like in this case, if I may have yeah. one follow-up, it seems like the, there was a particular day, namely January 6th, when it was touch and go. So let's say the exiting president invokes it, but before he, put, before he announced that, the Electoral College vote had been approved, yeah. Yeah. and so then 
Does he have the power to exit, or does the person who's been won the electoral college vote say, no, it's all over, I'm in charge now? Larry, you're sounding like a law professor now with these hypotheticals, so I'm, I'm not exactly sure, to be honest with you. I'm not exactly. All this, fortunately, is virgin territory, but it may be virgin territory we're about to enter, that's all. So I don't know. I don't know. And who would decide? I mean, who would decide? I mean, I think that's one of the problems as well. All right, shall we wrap this thing up, ladies and gentlemen? Thank you very much for your participation.